Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Moritz. I'm a partner with Lightspeed Venture Partners, where I lead our gaming and interactive media work. Um, we've actually been the number one lead investor in the space ever since we created our dedicated gaming practice in late 2022. Um, and it's a topic that's really close to my heart, gaming. <coughs> um, and I'll spare you my bio, <coughs> look at it online, but I thought I'd rather start by why gaming and why this topic is so important to me, not just because I recently became a father myself. Um, you know, I, I grew up to not too much of a parental expectation, quite frankly, in a small cow town in Germany. Um, my parents had both dropped out of high school, my brother had dropped out of high school, and so they asked me to please finish school. I thought it was well doable while also playing a bunch of video games. Um, I fell in love with Diablo 2 in the early 2000s, so that was my outlet during middle school and high school. Played every day for six to ten hours, almost eight years. Um, peaked at global number one ranking twice in 2003 and 2004, and made some good money with in-game item sales that I used to finance my education, um, both college and then grad school in the US. And it only connected to me much later that professional gaming and competitive gaming really was my foray into excellence that I otherwise didn't have in my socioeconomic environment. It um, led to a lot of pattern recognition and thinking that I think was very beneficial later on in academia and in, in, in my professional life and even in sports. <coughs> and, you know, also over the last two, three years, I think I increasingly realized that it's a bit of a romantic perspective on gaming um, and it's not the experience that everyone's having online. And so with that, I think it's, it's all our duty of all of us who work in the industry to really try and get this right. And we have an amazing panel here today. Uh, we have Tommy from Roblox, Ricardo, former CEO and founder of King, and then Kieran from KID. And, you know, would love to start by asking you to please introduce yourselves. And then also it'd be great if you could share what are you playing today and what are your kids playing? <laughs> I'm Tammy Bomick. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm the Vice President of Civility and Partnerships at Roblox. And what that means is my team focuses in on closing the education gap between young people, parents, and teachers. I've been at the company now for eight years, which is a very, very long time. And I have seen so much throughout the journey at Roblox. And I think a lot of the reason why I love gaming so much is because I've seen young people be able to create and develop experiences on Roblox born out of their own imagination. <clears throat> they have made friends, they have learned a lot in terms of developing different skills, um, and really it's opened up a whole new world. So I'm really excited to be part of this, this ongoing journey to educate and empower young people, Gen Z, Gen Alphas, to make sure they're able to thrive in this next iteration of the internet. And games you are playing? So my favorite kids? game, maybe, maybe you all played, I hope you have, Dress to Impress on Roblox. I, I'm, I'm so, woo, oh, okay. yay, <laughs> Dress to Impress. <clears throat> I'm not very good, but I love the creativity of it. And if you haven't played it, please go in and play it. Ricardo. Yeah, Ricardo Zacconi. Um, now I spend more time busy playing games with my kids and the, most of the games are actually in, in, in real time. And uh, the favorite character uh, for my kids is actually uh, Mario, Super Mario. So you can imagine uh, we play Mario Kart and uh, I go also to Comic-Con. So I dress up also as a, Mario, as a Waluigi character, in fact. So we <laughs> very much impersonate into the, into the characters. <laughs> and of course I play Candy Crush. My near disaster experience was when I changed phone. I left King and I changed phone and I lost all my progress after 18 years of playing Candy Busy. Okay, sorry, of being <laughs> at King and I don't have any more my King address, so I had to start from zero. So, <laughs> so sorry for your loss. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kieran. Uh, and my name's Kieran. I'm uh, the co founder and CEO of KID, so uh, not your typical founder story. I'm actually a lawyer. Uh, so I've been a practicing lawyer for the last 15 years and a couple of years ago saw an opportunity to build out the digital infrastructure that would power kids online and provide an opportunity for any developer, game developer or otherwise, to build an inclusive experience that would move away from I confirm I'm over 13 
and into a, a space where you can actually recognize and empower the, the kids that are there. And my, now I've got two kids, my nine-year-old's playing Roblox, my three-year-old actually thinks YouTube is a game. Uh, and so he, he just wants to collect all the fast cars on YouTube. That's, that's all he's zipping through. For me, I, I've been uh, grinding through Power World since it, it launched <laughs> earlier this year. Very nice. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly lay out the complexity of the issue, and then we'll go through the different stakeholders, and, and we have experts here. But um, <coughs> it's a complex topic to get age-appropriate experiences for kids and teens online, especially in games, right? They're obviously the kids and teens themselves is about a billion gamers today that are in that age range. It's you know, a massive amount. They want access to games. In some cases, they're getting kicked off. Um, in some cases, they experience trolling, cyberbullying, harassment, grooming, all the issues we hear and read about. Um, and in some cases, maybe have experienced it as parents, which is another key stakeholder. Obviously, the parents, they want transparency. They want to make sure that they understand what the kids are up to online. And then um, there's the publishers, too. Um, they obviously are working tirelessly to create safe experiences for their players. Um, regulators have uh, taken a lot of notice, especially over the last three, four years. And so there's a big incentive to get this right, also to avoid fees. Uh, we'll work our way in reverse order. We'll start with the publishers, um, Tommy. Um, you know, kids and teens are building their online identity and community earlier than ever. Um, it's a huge responsibility for you to get this right. I know you've been focused on it for many, many years. Um, what are some of the key challenges that you've seen at Roblox uh, in the past, and how have you overcome them, and what are you still working on? That's a very long answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Roblox has been around for almost 20 years now, so it's, we've been around for a very long time. And we started out, really, in the, from the very beginning, with kids developing all of the experiences on the platform. So Roblox doesn't create any of the games that you see. It's all user generated, generated. And so with that, safety and civility have always been paramount to everything that we do. It's a constant upgrades, constant evolution. We are constantly learning new things and integrating it into the product and the policies of the company. If it's, it's really, it ends up being a business decision, right? If we're not making the platform is safe as it can be, then people aren't having fun and they leave. We don't look at it as just one specific age group. We really make sure that everybody on the platform has a safe and civil experience. We have filters in place, we have really strict community standards, and we actually just rolled out, we just announced um, yesterday two days ago, what, am I, what time zone am I in? On Monday, new parental controls that give parents a lot more clarity and visibility over into what their children are doing on Roblox. So now they can remotely manage by setting up their own account, linking it to their child's, getting access to a dashboard that gives them access to their friends list, um, to daily, setting daily time limits, um, to uh, content labels that, depending upon the maturity of their child, not every nine-year-old is the same. Some are more mature, some are less mature. It's up to the parent to decide what is the right content to put in front of that child. And then the, the final thing is communication. For our youngest children, for the youngest players on our, on our platform, it's important for us to set defaults built in that protect them. So we actually just turned off on-platform chat for any child that's under the age of 13. Mm -hmm. In-game, you can still chat publicly, but all of the one-to-one -one chats have been defaulted to off. If a child wanted to talk to a sibling one-to-one, -one, they would need to get parental permission to do so. So this is just one step of many steps that we'll be announcing over the next few months that continue to focus on the safety of the platform. And I think that not just for Roblox, but for any platform, this is going to be paramount as the regulation continues to roll out throughout the world and safety continues to be focused given how much time young people are spending online. Yeah, you, you touched a little bit on the, the role of the parents too, and I'm, I want to transition to that with, with you, Ricardo. I think What's different about parents today is that most of them actually grew up, or a lot of them grew up as, as gamers. 
um, I guess some, in, in your case, also built, built games for, for billions to enjoy. How, how has the parents' perspective on games changed? What's your perspective on, on screen time as someone who spends so much time thinking about games? Okay, maybe before I go into that, I give you first the perspective from a game developer point of view, and then I go on the other side, just jumping yeah, the Yeah, I other think side. game developers like screen time. Because on the, yeah, exactly. So there's a bit of a conflict there uh, between two personalities. But I think that from a game developer point of view, it depends very much on how the game is designed. So you can have a solitary game experience, in which case you have zero risk. The more social it becomes, and of course it becomes more fun, the more risky it becomes. And it becomes more risky when you have more possibilities of self-expression and communication. So if you, for example, in Candy, which was not targeting kids, but was targeting mainly an older female audience, there you didn't have actually many possibilities to self-express. You would see a gentle competition. But in the games we designed earlier, we had a community, and you could self-express yourself. And as soon as you have community, you always have things that you don't want. And, uh, and so you, as soon as you have that, you always have abuse automatically. So I think the, the monitoring of it is very important. Now, jumping on the other side, for me, it starts, um, first of all, saying, OK, how much time should the kid have to, to actually uh, to play? And in my view, personally, as a parent, I would like my kids to be busy with other things, first of all. So they have to be busy with school, they have to be busy with, um, with um, sports, with music, with playing physically with others, play dates, etc. And then if they have time, then also play, play online. And when they play online, I'd like very much to know what they are playing. And uh, of course, it depends on the age of the kids and how much you can control them. So mine are younger, so uh, the older is th 13, almost 14. Um, and, uh, and then, first of all, transparency about the content, transparency with whom they are playing, uh, defining specific times of how much they're they are, they are allowed to play, and, um, and then also be very careful if there is any communication with whom they communicate. And uh, if th when they play, for example, I, I like them to play on a big screen rather than just on a small device. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a world out there that there are many, many risks from, from that point of view. So I'm, I'm very careful. Yeah, the, I guess the, the way I, I rationalize my own screen time and, and maybe the positive benefits that, that came from it in, in hindsight, or it might be a story that I'm just telling myself, is it was this beautiful playground where you could explore, where you were trying to break a system apart, put it back together in ways that other people were not thinking about. Um, it was an an exercise in arguing from first principles, oftentimes in chasing global optima, not local optima. But I guess you can find these learnings and you can find that exploration also in, in many other ways. I mean, it's yeah. probably something as you want as a parent, but maybe the answer is not a, a no, small form factor screen. I think it's also important then to teach them how to use the, 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 the digital. So to be careful about spoofing, be careful about cybersecurity, uh, uh, be careful with, who, with, who, with whom they communicate, etc. Um, and then, for example, I think that ga games can also be ed educational games. So I invested, for example, in a company called Revise, where you can actually uh, learn while you play. Uh, and um, yeah, and I think, but I think that the dangers ahead actually are, especially using AI impersonation, the fact that someone might might be someone else. Uh, it's not always is it the risk of. <laughs> it's a real effect um, of someone that is not really a kid on the other side. So how do you identify that? Um, and teaching the kids to be careful, I think. It's, it's, it's not just about controlling, but also teaching them how to, how to, how to interact. So let's, let's talk about the kids and the teens, because they're obviously a major role in all of this. Um, way too often, the first experience is this infamous slider that asks whether you're you know, 13 or older. And I think kids have gotten pretty good figuring out that they should answer 13 or older. So there's all kinds of implications with that. But maybe even you know, from a perspective of possibly flipping the script, like rather than blocking kids, how can we maybe change the narrative and embrace them proactively in a way that works and that is healthy for them? 
I, I mean, th that's our philosophy. And just taking, you take the zoom out from a community and a society perspective, you think about kids today, the very first interaction they'll have online is that pop-up that asks them to confirm that they're 13 or to enter their date of birth. And within 30 seconds, they've worked out, okay, I get it. If I want access to this thing, I have to lie about who I am. That's their first interaction online. That's wild that the internet, which is so capable and is where they're going to, as you said, build so much of their identity and their community online, their first interaction with that incredible space is that they have to lie to it. And that, to me, is where it sort of starts, where you have to reinvent the wheel and think, okay, if, if we were to rewrite the script and move away from this and say, how do we build an inclusive experience where I respect you for who you are? Maybe you're seven, maybe you're nine, maybe you're 15, but I'm going to respect you for who you are, and I'm going to give you an experience that I think is empowering of you and is going to help you build that community online. And that might mean, you know, to what Tammy was talking about, okay, you can communicate with your friends, you can build that, that social network amongst your friends from, from school. It might mean that in terms of some of the more sensitive functions around, for example, marketing and advertising, those things, you know, dial in or dial out based on what's age appropriate. But I think it's almost seemed this, in, this, this mountain to climb, this insurmountable challenge. And, you know, a lot of online spaces just say, okay, I, 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 I can't deal with that. It's, it's too hard. It's too challenging. And therefore, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw that pop-up up and that de-risks and I'm good to go. Let's go. Let's, you know, we'll... But the kids are still there. And, and I think to a lot of what you introduced the topic with, which is around some of the flip side, the, the risks of online, it's because of that. Because if the platform ignores that the kid is there, then by its very nature, it means there is no safety. There's no parent connected to that child. There isn't something that, there isn't a space for that, that kid to be honest about who they are. They're already under that cloak. And I think that's the piece that is so important to fix. Talk a little bit about what you're building with KID. And like, for full disclosure, it's a portfolio company of ours. So almost by definition, I'm a, I'm a big fan. But um, I'll admit, in, in five years of doing gaming venture capital in the early stage, I've actually never seen a a company signed this many contracts in such a short time. So clearly, you're solving a very real issue uh, for, for publishers. Um, and you know, what, what, what is included in, in this offering? Is it basically just a parent dashboard? Are you doing age verification? Like wh how, how would you pitch this through uh, to publishers? <laughs> <laughs> so for us, it's three things. One is you need to be able to provide an inclusive experience. And if I say to a game publisher, do you want to access the younger audience? Do you want to build that community? They'll all say yes. If you make it easy and you, you build it without risk, then they'll all say yes. So the second thing is to ensure that you can de-risk. So there's not that liability. There's not that risk attached to um, moving into the, the younger audience. And the third one is, which I think was not something that we initially started with, and it's something we've discovered, which is actually when you bring parents into that dialogue, when you bridge that, that connection, and you bring that transparency to what Ricardo was saying, all of a sudden it opens up all these possibilities. And, and so that's the technology platform we've built, is so that it enables any developer to flick a switch. It can be inclusive. It de-risks the platform in terms of liability, so they don't need to worry about going after the younger demographic. But it brings the parents into the experience like never before. And we built a lot of, we're investing heavily in building that connection and surfacing for the parents things like, what, what are the positive interactions that your kid has had in the game? What are, what's the community that they're building? Maybe they become a leader in that community. Maybe they're the moderator of their community. Maybe they're someone who's helping others learn how to play their game. And if you surface that to the parents, all of a sudden, you not only bring the parents in in, in a supportive way in terms of that, ga that kid's gaming, but you also often bring the parent into the game as well. Let's... Uh Let's throw it back to the publishers, um, Tommy. You know, there's been a series of announcements last week of um, Roblox building out its safety and security catalog. Um, cynics will say that that was a response to activist engagement, but I know that you've been working on this for many, many years. So, um, what is this this latest step up? Um, are you working with KID on this as well? Like, how how are you thinking about expanding? Uh, from here? Like, what, what, what are things that Roblox still needs to solve? There's a lot. It's endless, right? When it comes to safety, 
there, it's, it, our work is never done. I think there are a lot of different opportunities. I, I honestly think the KID is looking at things in a very fresh, unique way. And so we are, we are working with you guys. I think that, um, again, really focusing in on um, continuing to use artificial intelligence in a way that really truly makes things safer. I think that for the developers and um, entrepreneurs in the audience, my biggest advice is center in on safety first. Because at the end of the day, if you, you're making a consumer product that is safe, people will come, they'll continue to use it, there'll be brand trust. Um, and, I, as, as, and I can speak from Roblox as we've grown we now have close to 90 million daily active users on the platform. If you think about it, we're larger than a lot of countries in the world. There is great opportunity, but there are always going to be bad actors, always. And so, um, you know, there's, there's, there's an unending amount of work that needs to be done to make sure that everybody on the platform is safe, that we continue to evolve the moderation systems, that we continue to you know, keep an eye and educate policymakers so that we can have balanced regulation that works for everybody, that's not a lockdown approach, but is one that is, keeps people safe, but allows them to express themselves and be able to be creative. So, I mean, I think that from a publisher's standpoint, I really think it's important that safety is the main priority. I'm not just going to let you drop the AI bomb on stage without going into further specifics, so how is AI actually helping with it? Is it, um, is it voice moderation and kind of like voice screening and text screening? Like what, what are the things that can be done? Yeah, so we use um, AI in a lot of different ways. So again, with moderation, with a community as big as ours, you can imagine the amount and the volume of um, reports that we get. The vast majority of the reports that we get are inactionable in that they're letters that kids are typing and sending in. And so we use AI to get rid of the noise and identify the, the, the real issues. We have human, thousands of human moderators, highly trained, to dive into those details to be able to evaluate the problem and act quickly. Mm -hmm. So AI, that, that's just one area. Um, we also look at safety as not just ubiquitous to Roblox, but we really want to lead in this area. So as an example, um, voice moderation, we just released open source models that um, many companies have started to use our voice moderation real-time models to keep their products safe. So again, open sourcing um, our models, something that we'll continue to mm -hmm. take a look at and to continue to share. Um, we're involved in many partnerships, one being the Tech Coalition, which is you know, a band of 50, 60 companies that work together to share signals and work together to make the internet a safer place. I love that segue, it makes my life easy because I wanted to ask Ricardo about collaboration in, in all of this. I mean, it's such a complex issue. Like, do game publishers have to work together? Do countries have to work together to, to fix this? Like, what's your take? Like, what, you know, is, 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 I mean, stri it strikes me as more than something that just Roblox can, can fix by itself. Well, I think that you can wait for regulation to come, but it's always a challenge because every country has its own national, uh, let's say, regulation often, and to have everyone ag agreeing on the same regulation is difficult. I think it's much better that basically the game developers or content developers act responsibly first, proactively, and they make sure that they take all the possible precautions. And that's why I think KID is so, is so useful. I'm a, you know, I have not invested in KID, but still <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big fan. We had a long discussion yeah. yesterday because I think that it starts on one side with, with the content creators trying to make sure that when there are kids, you reduce the, the risks by, for example, making sure that there is no communication. If there is communication, communication is monitored. Uh, if there is a community that you identify possibly the age of the, of the, of the participants and uh, you do anything possible to do that and, uh, and you monitor also, I think AI can be very useful to monitor conversations, for example, and any, any moment that there is something that might be out of control, that's where I think AI can be very powerful. And, uh, and on the other side, I think giving also parents the right tools, easy tools, 
that's fundamental because today, as a parent, you need to you can set up parent controls at the content level, at the phone level, at the Wi-Fi level, and ultimately, it has to be simple and easy. And I think that's where I think if one tool becomes ubiquitous, there's a big advantage as a parent because you don't need to learn for every different content your children might use a different a different tool. So, big fan. You got plenty of fans. I mean, you're live now in, in a few games, with many more coming that we can't mention just now. Um, but I guess since, since you're now live and rolled out, like what have been some of your favorite surprises? What are, what are some not-so-favorite surprises that, <laughs> that keep you up at night? So I, I think one of the interesting things about the technology we built, it's built to be cross-platform, it's built to be agnostic, it's been to, built to be a central way where parents can have that interface across multiple games with one consistent language and, and whatnot. When you do that, but you're integrating into VR, Steam, mobile games, you're now, you're now looking at the player experience and um, how the engine interacts with that player as they're coming in, whether they're like 11 or 14 or, or they're older. And it's completely different when you're dealing with VR versus with you know, mobile. And I'll give you a really specific example. We initially built our, our parent verification process to run, run off QR codes, because we thought that's the easiest thing. It pops off on the TV, the console, it's on mobile, like it's really easy to use. V VR QR codes aren't going to work. And so you immediately start having to innovate in terms of what does that look like. And we came up with some amazing immersive things. I mean, some of the other cool things are when you're looking at you know, the, the binary choice of a parent saying, oh, I'm going to turn this off or I'm going to turn this on. Well, actually, if you're dealing with a younger kid, it's not just about turning it off. It's like, what can you do instead? And so one of the things we've seen is like taking audio chat and replacing the audio chat with something else. So you're not actually turning it off. You're still making it an immersive experience for that younger player and a really fun experience. And you bring novelty, novelty to, to that experience as well. That's where I think we get really, really excited. This is for Gorilla Tech? Yeah. So how does that look in Gorilla Tech? It's the, you know, the audio chat is, yeah. is monkey and gorilla noises. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, so if you're a younger you know, user and you're coming to the experience, that's exactly you know, how it is. It's not just silence and, and yeah. off. And I think that's where, once you start thinking about this in an empowering and, and an inclusive way, all of a sudden these other things start opening up. That's awesome. Um, we have a quick fire finale. Um, so I want to make sure that You know, if there's anything you want the audience to walk away with tonight, um, if, if there's one thing um, that you want to share, like what, what would that be? We'll start with you, Tammy. So my advice to parents is don't be afraid of gaming. There is a huge wide world of learning in gaming, and our role as parents and as game publishers, industry, It's to put, to, not to take the device away from our children, it's to put the device in their hands and teach them how to use it so that they can grow up to be resilient and empowered humans. A slightly different perspective. Don't give them the device too early is my personal view. I think they should still focus on the real things. But teach them to be independent, which means how to use things and in a... In a Be careful, know what the risks are, and know how to deal with them. Uh, but don't, I'm not actually, although I'm coming from the digital side, I'm sorry, I, I want them to be busy with other stuff first. And by the way, I agree. I think there should be <laughs> balance in life. I don't want anybody on Roblox 24-7, please. <laughs> For me, it's that we talk a lot about all of the regulation and a lot of the, the governments forcing this. We talk a lot about the toxicity and a lot of the insights that have been revealed over the last few years, particularly around social media and, and some of that in terms of kids and teens online. But here's the, the insight that I didn't have until quite recently. The expectation of us as parents for our kids is so different to our parents when it came to us. Mm. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to lay the foundation for that inclusive and empowered experience for kids when they're going into all these online spaces going forward, because that is where they will build their identity, and it is where they will build their community at a younger age than any of us ever did. Well, and on that note, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to the audience. Hope you have a great rest of Slash. <laughs>